God is an awesome God. It's hard to have gone through today and been in the Lord's house and been out in the community and seeing the beautiful creation and think anything otherwise. That the Lord certainly is awesome. He shows his handiwork to us in so many ways. Let's go to the Lord as we begin in a time of prayer. Brother Joey, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father, we're grateful to be in your house once again tonight, to be able to worship you and praise you. Lord, we do thank you for a beautiful day that it's been, Lord. Thank you that we've all been healthy enough to enjoy it. And Lord, we thank you that we get to look out and among the flowers and the trees and just see your hands at work. Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings you do give us in our lives. Thank you for always showing us grace and mercy. And Lord, we love you with all of our hearts, Lord. And we are here tonight to try to uh, show you that and to try to honor you and worship you as best as we can tonight. And Lord, we pray that you would accept it. With open arms, Lord, and we'll do our best uh, to worship you. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
some of the girls' rooms, and they'd all scream. <laughs> and she started coming here, and I think she was saved here. Have we turned that little girl away? But my point is this, is um, children are special. And uh, those lock-ins were hard. We didn't get much sleep, but they produced a lot of fruit. And I just thank the Lord for the ones that, that participated in it. Amen. Good to see you this evening, or whatever time it is. Doesn't, doesn't the time change really mess with you? It does with me, but I'm it's church time, whatever time that is, uh, we're here. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. Some, some of us were discussing it in the hallway this morning before the early service. And Fred, I told him it reminds me of going to, to Zambia or South Africa just a little bit. You get on a plane, they keep it dark like they do a chicken house so you don't know what time it is. So they, you just fly in darkness for about 16 hours and you land, they tell you it's some time and you just have to believe them. But what you really know is it's six hours different than it is here and it's kind of tough and it's even worse, I think, going to, it took 12 hours to go to Taiwan. So uh, uh, anyway, so we're whining and moaning like we do in America over little things, but uh, it could be worse. Uh, we could uh, not just lost an hour, we could be losing part of our life. And uh, in some ways, I think some people th say, well, we've lost a year. Well, only if we've given it up, we have we lost it. Uh, we don't have to say we've lost a year. We can reclaim, redeem the time. The days are evil, the Bible says, so let's make the most of the time. So let's don't let time get away from us. I appreciate what Delilah said. Uh, last week's sermons dealing with children, let's be aware, let's keep saying yes to children's ministry, whether it's breakfast duty, whether it's vacation Bible school, whether it's Sunday school teaching of the children, whether it's driving a van on Wednesday, there's something for everybody in ministry and there's something for you 
uh, dealing with children. So uh, we're looking forward to what God is uh, reviving us forward to do, and uh, we can't wait to see what that looks like as we go forward into the spring. And we're glad that you're here tonight. We're going to pick up part two of a sermon series that I said this morning uh, that most people wouldn't like. Well, I was surprised. Several people said, oh, no, we really, we really needed that. So I, I hope that we all understood what we meant by that, which is uh, it, it's more fun to preach on some topics. Uh, it's not really fun to preach on dealing with sin, except for the fact that what we realize is instead of a process and a protocol manual that we, in case of emergency, break glass, then we get it out, and then we say, well, this is the worst thing I've ever been through. Let's do one, two, three, see if it'll work out. If we would not relegate Matthew 18 to that kind of position in our life, if we put it in the first part of our life, in the heartbeat of what we do every day to keep our accounts new and fresh and short, and any kind of shortcoming we have with others or others with us, we'd find that we wouldn't get to step three very often. And we'd take sin more seriously every day, but not just their sin, but we'd take our sin more seriously every day. So this evening, we're going to kind of pick up and we're going to address some things that some of you said, well, you didn't really get that covered. We're going to pick up today and go forward, and we're going to begin in verse 18 and read through verse 35. So if you'll stand with me. We're still preaching on 2020 hindsight, looking back in a year where maybe you didn't get all the sin dealt with that you should have, but we can. We can catch up, and we can get our accounts made right. Verse 18 says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brothers sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he, had, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then the master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you, to each of you from his heart. Excuse me. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for an opportunity to open the treasury resource of your word and, Lord, let you pour into us the wealth of wisdom, not of this world, but of eternity in heaven. God, that you give us an opportunity to live this life based on your resources that empower us together to take a stand against what's wrong but to take a stand in favor of what's right. God, we thank you that, that love and grace are never wrong. God, we admit to you that we are often selfish, judgmental, and harsh with others while we seek grace from you. God, we pray that you would impress upon us continually 
that we would measure others with the same measure with which we would like to be measured by. God, that we would show grace as we've been shown grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Tonight's sermon continues on from this morning's sermon of a, a dialogue that Jesus was having about dealing with, with being offended or an offense that comes your way. And last week we were talking about offenses specifically that come people's way because of, of how they wrongly treat children and wrongly minister to some and not minister rightly to others. And so there's all sorts of offenses. That may not be what's going on in your life. You may have been harmed by someone in some way. And we mentioned this morning that all of us have been harmed and there's personal harms, there's public scandals, all sorts of things that we face. And we have to own those from the standpoint of we need to admit when we've been hurt. We don't need to hide that from can't hide it from God, and you're not very good at hiding it from yourself. If you try to, it just turns into a festering sore, like a small splinter that turns into a great infection in our life, and, and we're not pleasant to be around, and others uh, do not want to be around us either, and we, before long, the person that we're angry with or, or has hurt us is not the only person we don't like to be around. If we're not careful, we just become a recluse and a, a sore kind of person because we are harboring these ill feelings. Jesus taught us that he wants us to preserve peace and preserve unity in our lives and in his church. He wants us to live at peace individually with him and live at peace corporately with one another and to also be pure. So to find peace, we're not just simply winking at sin and ignoring any problems in our life. We address them, but we do so in a loving way so that we regain our brothers and sisters when there's any kind of separation or any kind of strain in our lives because of sin. We want to regain that brother or sister. We want to reaffirm our love for them. And he gives us this system, if you will. Go alone individually. If that doesn't work and they don't hear you, you go back and you take others who are mature, who can handle responsibility. You don't have to put that out on the internet to take applications among a thousand people because that defeats the point. You just need a couple people to go with you to help in this situation, to sort through your soreness and their sin and find the intermediary ground and to find a solution. When solutions are offered, we need to accept those. If we're not acceptable to the solution that's offered, we need to have an offer ourselves of what would satisfy the harm that's come. If it's not within you to accept an apology or offer a recourse, then we need to understand that sometimes that sin is now on us now because we're not willing for someone to be reconciled. And so we see that Jesus' process necessitates our personal involvement and also, in a sense, the public involvement of others who are in the church and who are Christians and who are mature. And sometimes, if that doesn't work, we get to the third step we saw this morning where it can come up before a larger group of people referred to as the church. Now, one thing we didn't go through, as of this moment, the church, as we think about it, didn't exist, okay? So when, for some who think, well, this has to be a Baptist deacons meeting they're talking about right here, uh, the church didn't come about to Pentecost, and so Jesus is looking forward to a group, but even there, they would have been called out ones, the ecclesia, those who are called. And so that may look different if you're in Georgia versus if you're in uh, Mexico versus if you're in Taiwan versus if you're in Zambia. What, what he's talking about there is you can tell it to a larger group of people that collectively will now relate to this person who is in sin in a different kind of way. That's right. We're going to throw a rock at them. No, we're not going to throw a rock at them. We're going to throw love at them. We treat them as someone that now that we don't say they're, they're probably saved, we treat them now as someone that in our spirit we say that they, they may very well be lost. And so we shift gears in the way we approach that. And so that's a summary from this morning. We pick up today, number one, this evening. Jesus' process for addressing sin gives us a divine perspective on the proceedings that are taking place. Now, we have to realize we live in this horizontal plane. We live seeing eye to eye with other human flesh people who walk around who have some of the same problems we do. And because of that, we often see things very much from our perspective. But what we see here is Jesus reminding us of a God perspective in verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, loosed on earth, loosed in heaven. You say, well, that sounds familiar. Aha, uh -huh. that's why it's great to read the Bible and preach the Bible in some continuity. Because in my Bible, you don't have to turn the page. You just go to the previous page 
In chapter 16, you remember this guy named Peter? He comes up again tonight, by the way. But in chapter 16, he was there. The disciples were asking Jesus, or Jesus asked the disciples, who do they say that I am? And they said, well, hey, some say this person, some say another person. But Peter had the right answer. Y'all remember that? Well, I say that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you've answered rightly. And because you have the right answer and a zeal for that answer, I'm telling you that it's on that kind of faith that we're going to build the kingdom of God. Peter's not the foundation of the church. Jesus and who he is as the Son of Man, the Son of the living God, the Christ anointed one, is the foundation of the church. Peter's faith in it is how the church will be built. And Jesus makes this great proclamation to him, on this rock I will build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And then this stuff again about loosing and binding. And we remind ourselves that sometimes we get all tied up in that. What does that mean? Does that mean I just go through the world just claiming stuff, grabbing stuff? If I want it, I can have it. No. What that means is, is that the work that the church is doing, exemplified and called out of Jesus in Peter's life, has eternal weight. <laughs> As Delilah mentioned of a, of a simple lock-in years ago, that there's something godly and eternal that happens at lock-ins. As we shared this afternoon in a funeral celebration of and a home going for Sydney Stokes, that as some of us last January and February were in a Bible study at Miss Stokes' house, and we studied about prayer out of the book of James, and Brother Fred shared with us, and we shared who we're praying for and who we're lifting up, and as Miss Stokes lifted up her son Sydney to the Lord as needing a, a God moment in his life to turn around, that God was doing things through his church on that night in that man's life, although it had not even yet happened. Calling things that are not as if they are. That God's going to do it. Loosing and binding happens every day in the church. The work you're doing to set people free from sin. The work that we're a part of to bind them in eternity to Christ and his gospel. These things matter. To pour into them how to live and live Christ-like lives. Teaching them to obey the things that I have commanded you. This stuff matters. And Jesus told Peter, hey, that's what it's going to be like, and we're going to be doing this stuff together. And now, because some of us, well, that's Peter. You know, that's him. I mean, we, we told you, preacher, Peter, Peter's got the stuff. Listen, Jesus tells the church they can borrow Peter's keys. Did you ever see that? I don't like it when people borrow my keys, by the way. It happens all the time. So my, and I'm not picking on y'all people. Hey, Pastor, you know, uh, my, my, you, can I borrow your keys? And if I roll my eyes when y'all ask me that, I'm sorry. I'm just a flesh person walking around looking at you eye to eye, horizontal. I already told you that tonight. And, and the reason is I've got this innate fear. They won't come back to me. <laughs> and then I'm going to need them. Then I won't have them. It's nothing about you. It's, well, they're, my, they're my keys. You know, I don't know. House key. My builder gave that to me 15 years ago. And. Car key, the dealer's guy, gave that to me, you know, 15 years ago. Church key, the, the, the builder, gave that to me 10 years ago. I'm, you know, it's important stuff in there. And then you hey, can I borrow your keys? Uh, okay, <laughs> here you go. <laughs> we kind of worry about that, don't we? Do you know God's divine perspective on all this church stuff, is church really important? Oh, church is important. Because God, and we know it's important because God is letting us borrow his keys. To bind and loose stuff. To open and close things. To deal spiritually in people's lives in ways that are weighty and matter. And so don't ever let somebody tell you it doesn't matter if they go to church. Or it doesn't matter if you go to church. Or it doesn't matter what you do at church. It all makes a difference. And when I say at church, I don't mean just at church. I mean as the body of Christ. Somebody was talking to me recently about some things that are going on in our community and through our church, whether it was food or, or Christmas cards at the jail. We've got all kind of or Easter cards now. We're doing Easter cards at the jail. Did y'all know that? 
Oh, it's so exciting. I can't wait for some of y'all to see it. Sister Marie did some artwork that we're going to use somehow here at this church. We're going to have to do some stuff that we hand out other than the jail. But, but it's Easter-oriented, and it's exciting. Food boxes and go ministry yesterday and all kind of things that are going on. And we get to handle that, and we have God's keys, in a sense. He lets us be involved in doing things that unlock eternity in people's lives and bind them to Christ forever. Number two, not just Jesus' process giving us a divine perspective of why this is so important, but Jesus' process reveals the eternal ramifications. Why it is important is because it, it matters forever. That These are eternal consequences. Aren't you glad there's some things that have happened in life that really didn't matter eternally? You ever remember, oh, I'm trying to remember what the old commercial was where the guy says, says, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. What was that? You know, that old commercial from the 70s, he eats too much. Was it Alka-Seltzer. I knew it had something to do with eating too much. Alka-Seltzer. There's a man after my own heart. <laughs> Amen. You know, aren't you glad for Alka-Seltzer? <laughs> okay. It's a temporary problem. We, we just, we overeat, ate the wrong thing, glad it, glad it doesn't last forever. Listen, the gospel is dealing with the things that last forever. That's why it really matters. We're not asking people to pick Ford versus Chevy. We're not asking people to pick Georgia Bulldogs versus the Crimson Tide. We're not asking people to pick Democrat, Republican. We're not asking people to pick left or right. We're asking people to pick Jesus above all else. And it matters forever. The divine perspective is that we are involved in important work that has long-term, eternal, never-changing consequences. And Jesus reminds of that, very, of that very quick, very clearly. Verse 20 says, For that where there are two or three gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. Number three, Jesus reminds us of a very present reality. Say, so, well, 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 preacher, you mentioned a, a prayer meeting in February and March of last year that, that had ramifications in December of this year. Can you tell me when the next important prayer meeting is? Well, it was an hour ago. And now it's now. Old illustration I heard many years ago about a sign that hung at the gate of a forestry division where they took large trees and made lumber and it says the best day to have planted a tree was 40 years ago same way with prayer the best day to have prayed was yesterday or the day before but then underneath that it says the next best day is now today it, it matters so if it was important Last year, or 10 years ago, it's still important today, so, so let's don't get busy pretending more. Let's just get busy participating more completely. The present reality is, is that the Jesus that was in that room with us at Sister Jean's house in February and early March of last year is the same Holy Spirit that's here right now. So when you're dealing with sin... <laughs> When you're addressing it with truth and approaching it with love in people's life, you need to know that the Holy Spirit is in it to win it with you. Oh, you know, and the, I mentioned this morning in the early service, I think I failed to mention it in the second service, that often when people tell me about something that needs addressed and they're toting the mail for person one and person two is the one coming to me and all this stuff, we, we forget to realize that we're not sending this novice young Christian to tell somebody their feelings are hurt. We're not doing that by ourselves. We're not sending them by their self. The Holy Spirit of God is there. He's there. And by the way, if two people have a spirit to want to harmonize, they can. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Harmony can be found. 
Unity can be claimed. Sins can be forgiven. Forgiveness can be granted. Grace can be received. That's what you say, preacher. No, that's not what I say. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what Jesus provides. That's who he is. So we remind ourselves of that present reality that it's not just something, well, that was good 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked around with his disciples. No, praise God, that's real good right now. <laughs> that's a present reality today in this room tonight, in your school, in your workplace tomorrow. Jesus, if two, of you, two or three are there and you're gathered together and you say, we're going to agree that we're going to get this right, Jesus will honor that. Now, we, we shift gears into verses 21 and following, and what we find is that Jesus' process applies to our personal circumstances. Some of you right now are still saying, I know, Jesus is here, he was there, he'll be there tomorrow, and that's good for you, and that was good for others, but I don't know about me. Well, let me let you know something. You're in really good company because your name could be Peter. And again, the more I study the Bible, the more I just love Peter. Because that could be my name. I'm, we could be him. You could be Peter, and I could too. Because when we preach sermons like this morning and so far tonight, we're all sitting back there playing the, the spiritual loophole game. Yeah, but there's got to be a loophole. Yeah, but there's got to be an exclusion. And yeah, but this cannot apply to where I am in my life. I know it applies to all these other places, but it really doesn't apply to me and what I'm going through. And if you think you're alone in that, you're not. Your name's Peter. Because Jesus just taught all these disciples this truth about how sin can be addressed, love can be expressed, and reconciliation can take place. Or if it does not, we then just shift gears and understand that we're going to treat that person with love and respect and reach out to them with the gospel now. And Peter says, yeah, but you don't understand. Peter's like, hey, I've got this guy, Jesus, in my life. <laughs> Do y'all have any of these people? Don't point to anybody in the room. But y'all have some of these people in your life? Peter had one. Lord, how often am I supposed to let my brother sin against me and then forgive him? Seven times? Now, what we know is, is Peter thought that was a really religious sounding number. Seven times. That's enough. Sounds religious. Read something about that number in Sunday school two or three times. Seven days. <laughs> that, 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 ought to, that ought to satisfy God. Jesus said, I say to you up to seven times, not up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Don't you love it when Jesus blows off the top of our calibration tools? <laughs> I mean, we're like, we're not measuring grace on a little one-inch or uh, one-foot ruler, okay? That's how we're measuring grace, forgiveness, God's ability. And Jesus says, throw that thing away. He said, I'm measuring this thing in light years. <laughs> My ability to forgive is so far beyond your measurement device, you need to throw it away and put it in the garbage and quit measuring. That's part of the point. Because some of the legalists are like 70 times seven. You're back there doing the math right now. How many times is that? Jerry, phone a friend. How, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? You're not going to count that many times. Jesus is saying, Peter, quit counting. Remember what we said this morning about how in the church, if we would quit relegating chapter 18, verses 15 through 18 to in case of emergency break glass, this is what you do at a business meeting if somebody shows up and says something awful about somebody. And that hadn't happened in a long time. But if it does, boy, it's in our bylaws. This is what we do. We'd have to go look it up because nobody could remember. We've got to get that out of that part of our spiritual religiousness, and we've got to get it back into our daily devotion. That was your challenge this morning just read Matthew 18, 15 through 18 every day this week. And what we'll find is we might be convicted of somebody we need to approach and say, hey, you need to apologize to me. But I think more of us would end up seeking somebody out and saying, hey, wait a minute, I need to apologize to you. 
Because while I was praying about all the people that have offended me, uh, God has given me a list of people I've offended. And we know that's part of the intent of it is because that's what's happening to Peter now. Hey, wait, wait, God, you, there's this guy, and, I mean, he's a mess. And how often am I supposed to keep up with that? And Jesus says, quit keeping up with it. And don't you know that just made Peter mad initially? And then Jesus tells this marvelous story about this ruler that had this guy that owed him a bunch of money, <laughs> so much he couldn't pay. And he goes and he says, you need to pay me. And if you don't pay me, I'm going to throw you in jail. And I'm going to sell you wife, sell your kids, and I'm going to take all that, and maybe you'll pay off. And he just begged him. He said, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Please don't do all that. I'll do what I can. I'll pay forever. I'll make it right. Fell down, it says, verse 26. Ask for grace and mercy. Verse 27, the master was moved with compassion. Released him and forgave him of his debt. Verse 28, but. But that servant went out and found somebody that owed him a little bit of money. Not a lot of money, just a little bit. Comparatively speaking. A lot to him, but a little laid hands on him, took him by the throat. It's kind of vicious, isn't it? Man, it was serious. Pay me what you owe me. He did owe him. He was due the money. But then the servant did exactly the same thing. Fell down, begged him, be patient, have mercy. I'll pay you back. I'll pay you all. And he would not, but he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. And all the other servants was like, uh-uh. <laughs> By the way, remember what we said this morning? When we handle sin, when we handle broken relationships the wrong way, everybody else sees it. And so it doesn't just hinder your fellowship with the person you're hurt with. It begins to harm the fellowship of everybody in the body. The fellow servants saw it, and they went and told the master, you won't believe what he did. Oh, Bubba, you just forgave him, and then he went and found this guy that owed him much less, and he won't forgive me, threw him in jail. And the master reacted in judgment. Be careful what measure you want to measure judgment and justice by. Because the Bible tells us very clearly by that same measure we will then be judged by. And so I don't know about you, but I like to line up in the grace line, don't you? I, 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 I don't like to, I do like to, but I have to be in the grace line. I can't go into eternity in the legal line. I can't stand before God based on what I can do for him. Based on how right I am. I won't measure up. And neither will you. And so therefore, as a recipient of abundant grace found at his grace throne, that we can boldly run to, made possible through the blood of Jesus. We stand there continually say, wow, we don't deserve that. But oh, how we need it. But then we're going to walk to our Sunday school class or to our school or to our recreation places or places of commerce tomorrow and hold everyone else to a legal standard and say, well, you harmed me. You have to pay. You owe me a dollar. I want it now. You were supposed to pay me yesterday. Now I want two dollars. Are we going to be the people of grace. That's a question we have to answer daily. 
Are we going to extend the grace to others that Jesus daily extends to us? I hope the answer in our lives as a church is yes. Now, Jesus is not telling us this in order to wink at sin and overlook wrongdoing. He's showing us this in order that we might align with the unchanging compassion and character of God. That as we walk on this horizontal plane, looking at others eye to eye, day in and day out, we will see others who fall short, who mess up, who sin, and sometimes that sin is pointed toward us. But as we remember too, when we get up in the morning and look at the mirror, we'll look at the one who has sinned against us more than anybody else. Nobody's done to you what you've done to you. We fail. And yet Jesus has forgiven us. So we walk out of the bathroom looking at ourselves in the mirror and run into that first person who cuts us off in traffic. How are we going to respond? We deal with that first person who's been brutal verbally to us at school. How are we going to respond? You log on to your phone. Most of you, before you roll out of bed, it's the first thing you do. You turn your phone. There it is. And somebody is twittering or snapping or chatting or is doing whatever they do nowadays, and, and it's about you. How are you going to respond? Listen, some of that you better have worked out in your heart before it happens. Because if you're not, you're going to respond by the flesh. You're going to demand your pound of flesh from them. But God gives us this story to recalibrate us according to how Jesus sees us to say, look, Jesus knows what he's done for you. He knows the forgiveness you needed. He knows the forgiveness you asked for and pled for. Lord, save me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Most of you in this room have prayed that prayer. And if you did pray it, Jesus heard it. He says he will. Now, when others ask us for mercy and grace, what are we going to give them? Well, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. They don't need a piece of your mind. You don't have very much to give them. How about that? And neither do I. I need to hang on to what little I have. Jesus says, give them grace. Give them more Jesus than what they've ever seen before. We need to align in our relationships with one another in such a way that we align ourselves with the unchanging compassion and character of God. How does God feel? God so loved the world. See, now these, these people have wronged us so bad, we've already, we've already said, okay, we're going we're gonna to believe they're lost. That puts them in the world. Doesn't put them in the church, puts them in the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the unchanging compassion of Jesus Christ toward lost people. And so if we've gotten to the point, exasperated, exhausted every avenue spiritually to redeem someone that says they're a brother and bring them back, now we just say they're lost, so what do we do? We still show them the love of Jesus. And the character of God is a long-suffering, patient character. Well, I did that one time. Well, let me ask you how many times somebody witnessed to you before you got saved? How many times did somebody read the Bible to you, share with you, pray with you, pray for you, come see you, go visit you before you got saved? Everybody in here, that'd be a different number. And here's the reality. Nobody in here knows that number. Why? Because it's not seven. And because it's not 70 times 7. It's a number that we never bothered counting because we never knew it mattered. And somebody in this room is a list maker and a tote counter on the, ball, on the wall. And listen, you need to quit counting not because it doesn't matter. You need to quit counting because it does matter. And when you think you've reached your limit, God hasn't reached his. So quit keeping score. Keep, quit keeping score with your kids. Quit keeping score with your spouse. Quit keeping score with your coworkers. Quit keeping score with your pastor. <laughs> quit keeping score with the deacons. Quit keeping score. 
Now, if we sin, let's call each other out on it, and let's do so in love. Let's call that out so we can make it right. But let's quit keeping score. Because the reason we're keeping score is we think we get to quit when we get ahead far enough. Listen, I just want to end by saying I'm glad Jesus hadn't quit on me. And tonight, let's reiterate and ratify that we're not going to quit on one another. And we're not going to quit on our lost family and friends and neighbors. And we're not going to quit on some of the people that are on our church roll that may be lost. We're not going to quit. Jesus has given us the power, because it's his power, to stay the course, to take a stand against sin, but also to take a stand for the righteous, patient love of Jesus. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and stand to your feet. Lord, as we stand before you, someone needs to come and pray and receive Jesus. Lord, as we stand here tonight, someone needs to come and pray for someone they know that appears to need Jesus in their life. Lord, maybe they need restoration. Maybe they need forgiveness. Lord, maybe someone is lost. But Lord, we, we realign with your purpose and your character tonight. Lord, we repent and, and return to the fact, Lord, that you are a loving God. And thank you, Lord, that you haven't quit on us and we don't want to quit on you nor anyone else. Lord, we thank you that this church is involved in kingdom activity, which is eternal, and it matters. God, thank you for letting us be a part of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God, speak in your heart. You come. These altars are open for you, for prayer, to deal with the Lord. You come as we sing. You be obedient. I have this God's people said amen. No turning back, no turning back. Let's keep going. Let's keep doing and being who God has called us to be. I thank you for being here tonight. I love you. You're beautiful. Nobody's told you that today, Fred. You're beautiful. Uh, we're glad each one of you are here. Uh, the bride of Christ made, made acceptable through his blood, through his cleansing, not in our own, but through his. And so we thank God for an opportunity to be together in his house. We're going to dismiss from this place tonight. Remember to pray for our missionaries. Pray and participate in the Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. Uh, the offering plates are in the foyer. You can give at any time uh, you do that. God blesses that. And so uh, be here on Wednesdays. Invite people to come back on Wednesdays. Have a ladies Bible study in this room. 
There's all kind of room in this room, okay? Uh, we're, we've been running in the 50s on 815 service on Sunday mornings. That starts getting kind of foolish, okay? But uh, we're not running 50s yet on Wednesday night for the ladies, so there's plenty of space in here. And the men, we're back here. We got plenty of space back there too. So invite somebody to come be a part of the men's Bible study or ladies' Bible study or youth or children or anything else. Come on Wednesday. Men, cookout at TJ's house on Saturday at 6. I know he's hit up a few of you to bring a couple things. If you hadn't been hit up to bring something, well, bring something, okay? Bring bring a dessert or bring uh, some drinks or something, okay? Soda, and it'll be all right. We'll have a good time. Uh, bring yourself is the main thing, and uh, we'd love for you to come be a part of that, and uh, we're going to have a good time. It's a pep rally. We're just going to have a good time in Jesus, getting ourselves ready because we won't do an outreach of Men's Wild Game Supper uh, in April, but we got to get ourselves ready. we got to get all in a huddle, and we got to get a game plan, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Brother Jerry and Joseph and others have been talking and praying about it, and we're looking forward to what God's going to do out there in the backyard on uh, Saturday, okay? Anyone else got an announcement? I don't want to overlook. I about the lock -in hall there. What was that called? It was a mix of... And we would do a study, and we'd rotate around to the rooms, and it was really neat, and the girls really enjoyed it. I just wanted to make clear it just wasn't a fun time. It was a mission. Oh, yeah, it was a missions lock-in. All right, well, good. Learned about missions. And I think Delilah, yeah, I think Delilah and Paul are going to be organizing one for law. Or <laughs> Jane, all right. <laughs> no, some head notes. But hey, maybe we can organize a, what, what, what do they call that where you go from place to place? Progressive. progressive. We can have a progressive mission study. Hey, there's an idea. Uh, all right, we're, we're, we're going to come out of this thing, and uh, God's got some stuff in, in mind for us, and and uh, we want to find it. We want to do it. We want to be who God's called us to be. I love you. Uh, my prayer is that God will bless and keep you until we meet again. If I can help you, let me know because I'm not a mind reader. I can't figure it all out all the time. But I love you. And thank God for this day. It's been a great day. May God bless you and keep you.